I was going to pray when I got up here, but thank you so much for praying through Scripture like that. Thank you. Perfect. This weekend, I got a chance to go to a friend's wedding. Um, he's a gentleman I worked with at Mission Springs, my last job, and he was starting to date this girl right about the time I was leaving, and um, he couldn't stop talking about her. He's <laughs> like, I think she's the one. And it's crazy. And they were sharing this during the pastor sharing, like, hey, they like, knew at first sight, like, this is the person I'm going to marry. It was one of those crazy things, like, ah, oh, they know. But they were talking about this, and I, and I was actually talked to him the last time I was there. I was like, hey, what have you been doing? What's new? I know you're planning for a wedding, but like, what's new with you? He's like, it's been crazy. It's been busy. He works full time, and this is the middle of summertime at camp. Summertime is a crazy time. It's full bore. You're working seven days a week almost. But he had taken on a side job at a pizza company in town in order to make a little bit more money, in order to be able to pay for the wedding, to pay for the honeymoon, to make sure that everything was ready to go when his wife was, like, they were ready to be married and she was going to move in. And he didn't have any, like, much time to spare anyways, but he was taking that extra time in order to go and prepare for his new life with his wife. I was like, dude, that's awesome. You care so much for your wife that you're willing to sacrifice any kind of free time you might have had in order to prepare for her and your life together. Today we're going to be talking about God as being self-sacrificing, and we're continuing our series in, in the good and beautiful God. If you don't remember, this series is talking about the different narratives that we may see in our life. They may come up like, hey, this is what we believe in God, but it's just not right. It's maybe similar, but it's not quite right. And we're looking at scripture in order to reclaim that so we can fully understand who God is and we fall more and more with him. When we negate the fact that self-sacrifice, that God is self-sacrificing, or we do that when we believe that we can start earning God's favor. When we start believing that we can earn God's favor, earn his blessing, earning our salvation, we negate or deny the fact that God is self-sacrificing. We negate the fact that he was the one who seeked us out. We love to play these games like sardines and hide-and-go-seek, where we go hide, and people look around and try to find you. It's sardines, everybody's looking for one person. Hide-and-go-seek is one person finding many. And you're going and finding, and we like to think that we are the seeker. We're seeking out God all the time. But in all reality, God is very much more often seeking us out. He's there and he's looking for us. He's constantly coming after us, even if our back is turned towards him. And we forget that sometimes. The false narrative we're working from today is that we work our way to God. We work our way to God. We live in a performance-based world where everything you do is based on what you've done. I do better at work, therefore I get a better pay raise. I do this for someone, they do it back in return. You look at any major religion in today's history, it's all based off give and take. I need to earn favor with God. I need to pray to this God so I get water for my crops. Or I need to do this in order to get this from God. But we as Christians believe that God gave us so much more beyond what we could ever earn, that we are unable to do so. This idea, this false narrative can be summed up in this quote. Order your life properly, follow precepts, offer up proper sacrifices, and God will reward you with blessing. Finding God is largely up to you. It's not only logical, but it's also appealing because it allows us to remain in control. It allows us to remain in control. When I believe I can work my way to God, it allows me to be in control of my life, that what I do dictates where I go and how God will look upon me. And it's, it's sort of comforting. It's like, oh, I can control where I'm going. And in all reality, there's things that happen that we can't control. And when those things that happen that we can't control happen, we start asking, God, why? I did all these things right. I did all these good things, yet it didn't work. We treat God like a vending machine. It's like, hey, I did this good thing. I did this good thing. I did this good thing. So 
Give it to me. Yeah. I, I need your blessings. I deserve those blessings. I deserve these good things. It's not true. In Matthew 23, verses 27, this is part of a part of passage where it's the seven woes, and he's talking to the Pharisees and scribes, and he says this, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you were whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and uncleanliness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others. Within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Are we just doing these good things in order to look good in front of other people and to make God bless us? Or that we are doing these good things because it's an outpouring of our relationship with God, our good and beautiful God who loves us in his full grace and mercy. A few weeks ago, I was down in Modesto, and I was down running errands, and it was a good day. I I'd got my errands done. I was going to go grocery shopping. I was doing this so my wife didn't have to go. I was already down there. I might as well do the grocery shopping. And I go, and I fill the cart up, and I get everything I need. I get all the nice, like, like my food, like vegetables, the important things, and bread. And I get to the checkout stand, and a couple of people in front of me, she starts checking out, um, and she gets rung up, and the gentleman's saying, hey, you're $5 short. And she's frankly going through her cart, trying to figure out what she can put back. And I had watched her go through, and then she didn't have a lot of stuff. It was just like bare essentials, and she's like pulling the, like, the one thing that she like was a special item, which was like sour cream. Like you can have a dish without sour cream, but it makes it so much better. <laughs> and she's so frantic, and I and she's like she's all flustered, and she's like, "You need to pull one more thing out." She's going through her cart, and the guy in front of me is like, "I'm just waiting," and and I felt bad, and it's like, "Here, here's five dollars. Let me just pay for you." And I paid for her, and she went on her way, and, and the guy in front of me did that. And the, the checker's like, hey, good deed for the day. You hope you have some good karma. I was like, cool, thanks. So I check out, I pay, and I go to my car, load my car up, drive from Modesto all the way back here, 40, 45 minutes. I get home, and I start unloading. And my wife has sent me a text like, hey, um, do you guys, do you want like a boiled egg sandwich for lunch? I was like, yeah, sweet, that sounds good. So I've unpacked everything, and I go ready to get make lunch. And I go, and I look around, like, our house isn't very big. I look in the pantry, I look on the table where I put the, the, the groceries down, I look in the back of my car, no loaf of bread. And this is good bread. This is like Dave's killer bread. <sighs> I was looking forward to my mouth was sort of watering because I hadn't eaten up until this point. It was like six hours. I'm like, I need food. Or else I'm going to shrivel away and die. Not really. But the first thing is like, Sadly to say, but first thing is like, God, why? Why did I forget my piece of bread? Where did it go? I, I paid for it. It's on the receipt, but it's not there. I even did a good thing today. I'm like, so why did I do that good thing? Was it just so I would look good in front of those people in the cashier register, in the register line? Was it good so I have like a story to tell you guys? Like, yeah, I paid for someone's food in line. I'm all good. No. And the moment was out of like, hey, I hope that this will bless you. But I get home and like, hey, God, I did something good for you today. Why aren't you blessing me? I'm like, motivations. What is motivating us? We enforce this idea that we can work our way to God, this idea of moralism. It's like, hey, if you do this, if you keep all these commandments and all these things, you will be right in favor in God. Yes, these things are favorable to God. Like, yes, but we can't earn our salvation with God. If we believe that we can earn our salvation from God, it disregards the fact that we are sinners, that we were born into sin, fully corrupt, that God is the only one who can provide the payment for that corruption. In our Jesus narrative today, it says this, God works his way to us. And we're going to go all the way back to the beginning. Almost. We're going to go to chapter 2 and 3. We go back to the very near beginning, and we see God is working these things out. In chapter 2, God gives Adam a very special commandment that the only thing you should not do is eat from this tree. Because if you do, you'll surely die. I'm not sure if Adam actually understood what it meant to die. 
Um, he might have seen animals die, but he's never seen a human die at that point, probably. Like, death is probably a, a different concept for him. Like, it was kind of abnormal and weird. But Jesus, or God, said, hey, if you eat from this tree, you shall surely die. And in chapter 3, we see the serpent come to Adam and Eve, or to Eve first, and then to Adam, and convince them, like, hey, it's not that bad. You can eat it, but God's only saying that you shouldn't eat from the tree because you'll be like him. And they eat from them, and God finds, well, he knows. He's God. And they go, and they hear God coming through the garden, and they go hide themselves because they are aware of their, their shamefulness, it says. And God's calling out to them, like, hey, where are you? I can see you. It's a really, really bad game of hide-and-go-seek because <laughs> it's like last week when Kurt was saying, yeah, I hid in our blanket in the room in front of him. And they're like, oh, there you are. <laughs> or peekaboo with a little kid. <laughs> But God knew. And after that, he had to throw them out because God is unchanging. And he had illicitly said, hey, if you eat from this tree there, you will surely die. And they didn't immediately die, but they would have to experience death. But this is really cool. This is in the end of chapter 3, or towards the end of chapter 3. And the Lord says to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are all, or you are above all livestock, and all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and the dust you shall eat all your days. I will put enemy between you and woman, and your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall, or sorry, he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Some translations say crush. I like crush better. Crushing the head of a serpent. It's a much more satisfying translation. And I think it's much more relevant. Like, it's not just bruising. But this is a foretelling of God creating a way for us as humans to be in right relationship with him again after sin had entered the world. Even as soon as it happened, God was putting in motion a way for us to be right with him, that he would be seeking us out. Then we have a, th a couple thousand years between that and the New Testament. The Old Testament is full of prophecies and setting up for Jesus to come. We like to say that the Old Testament is looking forward to the Messiah and then the New Testament is looking back and justifying Jesus' coming. It's because of Adam and Eve we live in a state of corruption because we all desired to be like God, to know what good from evil, to know, truly know what it was. This idea of complete corruption is this. It's a state in which human beings are after the fall. It can only be reversed by the sacrifice of complete incorruption. Jesus was sinless. God was smart by putting references in here and having the same worksheet. No, it doesn't work very well. Here we go. In Romans 5, 12, it says this. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted to where there is no law. Yet death reigned in Moses, or uh, Adam to Moses, even those whose sinning was not like the transgressions of Adam, who was a type of one who was to come. So what Paul is saying here is, hey, if you know what is wrong, you're liable to sin. You have something that you can go against. And since God had given this commandment to Adam and Eve, they knew the law it was one rule. Don't do it. And because of that, sin entered the world. They are in complete corruption. And we are born into that world of complete corruption. Only God can provide a solution for this sin. It's because God is not limited by the physical body that we are, that he, they come into this world as a corrupt being, but comes as fully God and fully man. Sometimes I wonder if Adam and Eve could have said, like, I'm sorry, and we could have avoided this whole thing. Um, but in reading this and trying to figure this out and like working through this is, it, it doesn't just work like that. It isn't just like, hey, I'm sorry, God, for sinning. It didn't cover that sin. Because that sin requires death. That transgression required a payment of death. And they couldn't pay it. They couldn't pay it in full and survive that. So we, 
in turn need someone to mediate there. Continuing in Romans, this is Romans 15, 5, 15 through 17. It says this, But their free gift is not like the trespass. For many died through one man's trespass. Much more have grace of, uh, the grace of God and the free gift of grace that one man, Jesus Christ, had abounded for many. And their free gift is not the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following the one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following the many trespasses brought justification. For if, because one man's trespass, death reigned through one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through one man, Jesus Christ. So even though sin and death entered through one man, it was on all of us, Jesus Christ also brought the opportunity for us to have life, to have justification, to be right with God, to be just in his eyes. God took a big risk. risk. He took a big risk. He decided to love us even though we might not return that love, unrequited love. Unrequited? 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 He took the risk of not, not being reciprocated. We read this today in our passage in Romans 5, 6 through 8. It was offered to us even though we weren't ready. It says that while we were still weak, at the right to crime, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare to die. But God showed his love, uh, love of us in that, way, that he, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. There was nothing we were doing to make him come down. There's like, hey, God, we're going to repent, and we're going to be good. And if you come down and save us, we're all good. No, Christ came even though we weren't looking for him necessarily. He came down. The Jews of the time weren't looking for a savior in the way that we know Jesus Christ to be. They were looking for a conquering king, a king that would come in and rout out Rome and give him freedom again. But Jesus Christ has come like, I got something better for you. Life and life to the fullest. John says this in John, or John chapter 1, 10 through 11, or 10. He was in the world, but though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. He came to those who were like, we have the Old Testament. We were looking for you, but they were blinded to that fact. They weren't quite ready for that. We are talking about this in, junior, in high school this last week in junior high, how the disciples were on the boat and they were going across the Sea of Galilee and the storm came. And they're like, Jesus, help us. And they had all these signs and wonders that were shown to them. And they still didn't quite recognize who they were in the presence of. They weren't quite ready for that. I was thinking of an analogy for um, this unreciprocated love. And I had an interesting interaction this weekend. Cats. With a dog, you go down, you bend down, you offer a hand, and they smell it, and they usually come up to you and let you pet them. 99 times out of 100, they'll let you pet them. They're fine. They're good. They're chill. Cats, on the other hand, do not. It's like that game where you see in like night, late night shows, they put their hands in the box and they're trying to feel what's inside, and sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. Same thing with a cat. You put your hand down, and they smell it, and they're like, don't show them fear. And they might, like, come up and, like, nuzzle you and let you pet them. Perfect. Great. That's nice. I like to pet cats when they let me. But they might just snub you and walk away. Or they might bite you or scratch you. I worked one summer just, like, as a kitty cat wrangler, like, with kittens. My forearms were full of scratches. It might have been the rabbits, but it was mostly the kittens, I like to say. I had scars for, like, months and years afterwards. But cats are one of those things, like, they're more like us. Like, we don't necessarily reciprocate God's love in the way that we ought to, like a dog. <laughs> it doesn't come naturally. Like, sometimes we snub it. Sometimes we lash out. I'm like, no, we don't want this. This isn't good for us. But it's so much more than that. I was thinking, how hard is it to love those sacrificially that we do love? But even so, how do we do that for those who may be unlovable 
or unapproachable in our everyday lives? Are we willing to forgive, or am I willing to forgive those that I perceive them to have wronged me or done something against me, to extend grace and love and mercy to them, just as Christ has extended grace and love and mercy upon me? It's a hard question. I I, I struggle with that daily. Self-sacrifice, our self-sacrificing love is the greatest is greater than all others. Let me try that again. Self-sacrificing love is greater than all others. On the screen, you'll see a picture of wheat. Wheat. And wheat is great, because you make bread and other lovely baked dishes with it, like pie and cake and cookies and go on. But wheat is interesting because there's an image that when you have a plant, not just wheat in general, but when you have a plant, it grows up big and strong, it has flowers, it's pollinated, and then the flower dies in order to produce seeds. And those seeds are all living, they're green, and then they dry out and they start falling to the ground. And many times he's just like, oh no, the seeds are dead, and they're dying. But new life comes out of that. If that seed didn't die, we wouldn't have more wheat one head of wheat off of one thing can make many, many more. It can be multiplied. So you take one grain, you drop it down on the ground, and it grows, like you, it perfectly grows, and you pick it, and you have this whole head of grain. You have six, 60 grains. Then you throw that out, and it keeps on multiplying and multiplying. And if that one first seed hadn't died, we would never have that abundance. The power of the seed is only actualized in the seed's death. It's the idea of self-sacrifice. That one, the seed's one purpose is to die in order to bring forth more life. Christ died in order that many may have life. In John 15, it says this, greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down their life for his friend. There's no greater sacrifice than what God did to demonstrate his love for us. When we prepare, when we participate in this idea of self-sacrifice, when we put others before ourselves, we are actually participating in what Christ did for us. We were made in God's image and he willingly sacrificed for ourselves. We are ought to also sacrifice ourselves for others. That may look different for every one of us. Maybe that is giving more money. Maybe it's giving more time. I know when I was young and I was in high school and in junior high, I was like, I don't have money. I don't earn money, but I have time. How can I give my time? This idea of self-sacrifice can sometimes have a paradox. I apologize. I put my slides in the wrong order. This idea of paradox here, in Philippians 2, 6 through 11 says this, Though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God is highly exalted, highly exalted and bestowed on him the name above every name, so that the name that so that the name of Jesus every tongue will bow, every knee shall bow, in heaven and in earth and on the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord, to glorify God the Father. Jesus made himself low. He came like a man. He lived and died perfect. He didn't sin. He was sinless. He was blameless. He was that perfect sacrifice for us in order that we may be in right relationship with God. And because he made himself low, his name is exalted highly in heaven, high above. Jesus emptied himself out. He gave everything. We read in the Gospels how before he was taken in, he was weeping and he was wrestling. Like, this, take this cup from me. Do I have to go this way? He poured himself out literally 
blood and water flowed from his side. He poured himself out for us so that we can be in right relationship with God, that we can be in relationship with God. The greatest are those who serve, not the serve. Jesus could have come to earth and demanded all of us to follow him and to bow down before him and to flower or shade him with big old palm leaves and feed him grapes off the vine. But no, he came. He came as a servant. He came and served. He helped people. He healed the sick and the lame and the blind. He reached out to those who were in the margins, who were not, who were looked down upon, the Samaritan woman, those who were sick and poor, the tax collectors and the sinners of the time. He reached out to them at the expense of what people thought. It's like, why are you hanging out with sinners for? It's where I'm called to be. Christ made himself low in order to serve. And because of that, he was elevated in heaven. I think the key for today is this. Why did Jesus have to die? We ask this question, why did Jesus have to die? Jesus didn't have to die, he chose to die. The Father and Son and Spirit worked in harmony to reach out to the fallen and broken world in order to restore it. God did this so we, because we could never do it for ourselves. The cross is a symbol of God's love and sacrifice. Jesus assumed Jesus assumed and healed the human condition. And by doing so, he demonstrated the depths of God's love for all of creation. Here is the key principle of the kingdom of God. What you let go of will never be lost because it becomes a thing of beauty. What we let go of will never be lost. Are we storing up treasures here on earth or are we storing them up in heaven? I still never can wrap my head around the sacrifice that Jesus made. That God Almighty would make himself low, come down to heaven in order to live a life of that of a carpenter, of someone who was always on the road, that was never comfortable, in order to bring us rightness with God. Christ's act on the cross was an act of love and grace and mercy. And we too are called to act that way. In Ephesians, in Ephesians 2, where did you? Yep, in Ephesians 2, it says this, and walk in love as Jesus loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. If you skim down to the end, Verses 21 through 33, this is one that talks about marriage and how man and wife should love each other. And very often we take this passage and we're just like, hey, this is for marriage only. But if you go back to verse two, we see that God is telling us, or Paul is telling us that God desires us to love each of us in a self-sacrificing way. Just as Christ had poured himself out for us, us too should be doing that for everyone around us. Not just our neighbors, not just for our spouses or our siblings or the people who are nice to us, but for everyone. It's hard. It wasn't meant to be easy. (laughs) It's a sacrifice. If it was easy, it's not a sacrifice. We were called to do that. My challenge for you this week is this. This is not the soul train. This is my challenge. Think about who is hard to love in my life, and how can I love them better? Who is hard in my life to love? Who may not be that deserving of my forgiveness, at least in my mind, or my attention? Think about that. Just with a raise of hand, how, like, raise your hand if you've, like, tried one of the soul trainings we talked about this last couple months. Cool, good. This week's your soul training is this. Soul training. Not soul, but soul. You hurt your souls if you run. No. Um, but you're going to read the Gospel of John. Read the Gospel according to John. 
And you're going to do this a little bit differently. It's not going to be like a Bible study, but you're going to read it like a novel. So you're going to read like a couple chapters at a time. I would say break up to like uh, five to seven chapters. If you listen to it, it takes about an hour because they speak nice and slow on those audio recordings. But just break it up. It takes about 30 to 40 minutes in the morning or whatever time you charge about. Just read it in one large chunk or in large chunks. And let that absorb into you. In the first chapter, seven chapters alone, God or Jesus is doing so many miracles. I think there's like five to six of the major miracles. They're like, oh, this is cool. And if we break it up into little parts and just study one, we don't get the full breadth of what God is doing through Jesus Christ on the earth. We just let that absorb into us. Like we were talking with the children today. May those words go from your head to your heart. As you read them or listen to them, let them penetrate you. Let them flow into your heart and meditate on them. Wow, Jesus did that? And they didn't see who he was? Oh, it's amazing. You gotta remind yourself that scripture was very often written to be heard as an oral, um, interpret- or oral narrative. Old Testament was passed down from generation to generation before they wrote it down by oral tradition. It would tell stories to the kids so many times that they could not tell it right. <laughs> They, like, they had to tell it right before written. And now that it's written, we break it up into the little chunks. But just read it in large chunks and let that flow into you. I've been listening to it this last week. Just listening to it, like, oh, pour into me. And then ask yourself these questions. Because we don't, if we don't like, take some moments to reflect on this, we just forget about it. So some of your questions for this week is, were you able to practice this exercise? Were you able to set some time apart to read five or seven chapters together? If so, how'd you feel about it? Did you learn anything about God or about yourself? I sometimes realize it's hard for me to sit down and read seven chapters, but I could listen to it. And sometimes I have to get a different Bible because my Bible's distracting because there's footnotes and cross-references and all these little blurbs on the side that I start reading instead of just the scripture. Find a way that you're able to read five to seven chapters at a time or listen to them, ingest them somehow. And lastly, what's your favorite passage, story, or verse from that Gospel of John? Next week, come find me. Tell me what it is. I might be a little bit tired. I might be a little bit stinky. We have a junior high lock-in next week. So if you see like, people falling asleep, it's probably because they're up until three o'clock in the morning. That might be me. But come find me. I will do my best to... Just, hi, be awake. But come find me. Share it with other people. Like, hey, did you read the book of John this week? This is what I discovered. I had never realized that was in the book of John. Because maybe it's just a passage we don't study. Or maybe it's something we just gets lost as we uh, glaze over things. But just remind yourself, God was seeking you out before you ever found him. That from the beginning... In Genesis, God was discovering a way, was creating a way to make things right with him and man. That Jesus was and is the only way that we could have payment for sin because the wages of sin is death and there is no way that we can die and be born again in that way. We cannot pay that sin that Jesus Christ has paid. Go ahead and bow your heads with me as we pray. Father, we thank you so much for Jesus Christ, that you sent your son down, that he came and made himself low and lived a perfect life in order that he be a perfect sacrifice for you and for me and for all. That those who reach out and take part of that, Lord, are saved. Lord, may we never forget that gift that he gave us and that we are charged with the same thing, that we are going out and being sacrificially loving other people giving of our time and our resources, Lord, to be lights to these people. That our actions are not just to be actions to game you, God, to be earning your favor, Lord, but as an outpouring of our joy and love that you have been shown by you to other people, that we cannot keep this gospel story to ourselves, but it is such good news that we have to share it in everything that we do. Lord, we love you and we praise you. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. We stand for our closing song.